Brought to you by the Mutual Audio Network. Don't leave home without it. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. Okay, so can you say and spell your name for us, please, Kate? <coughs> um, Catherine Bryant, K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E-B-R-Y-A-N-T. But I go by Kate, uh, K-A-T-E. <laughs> okay. Okay, so Kate, what I'm going to do is, uh, oh, hang on, is Daryl ready? Yeah, I think so. He was on... Uh... Yeah, that was chill, that was chill, that was chill. Uh, okay, I know, I know. I, okay, I but heard. they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Okay, I, I, why don't you go in there and, uh, hey, um, you, uh, changed the battery on this thing? I did. Good. Okay, uh, well, why don't you go set up the camera and I, I'll go get the plaque. Okay, but hurry. I will. What? Dad, what if she knows? Uh, she won't. I know, but what if she does? She won't. <laughs> <laughs> Let me set this thing up. Okay. Oh, doggone it. Oh, shoot. Stupid thing. Who's that on the tape? That's uh, me and my dad. And what are the two of you doing? We're getting ready to... <clears throat> it's my sister Anne's 15th birthday, and we wanted to surprise her. So uh, Anne was at volleyball practice, and we asked Jill, my dad's girlfriend, to bring Anne home so we could surprise her. And what happened when you surprised her? She, um... Just play the tape. Okay, okay, okay. They're at the door. They're hey, at the door. Hey, shh. <laughs> so you know, it's really hard because at that point you want to set the ball up. Right. Wait, why is it so dark in here? <gasps> this Surprise! Is right. <laughs> oh, 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 it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> what? Anne? What's burning? Oh, Anne, God, Anne, 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 honey. It's okay. That's the end of the tape? Yeah, I stopped recording. What's burning? Mm -hmm. what she... Was there something that, that she smelled? Was there something that you and your dad or Jill No, smelled? I didn't smell anything. Neither did they. Not then, anyway. Can you tell us about what Anne did to you that same day in the middle of the night? Uh, she tied my hands and feet to the legs of the bed and stuffed a towel down my throat. She was mumbling something under her breath. It was fast and too quiet to hear, but it sounded like <clears throat> the way someone play, uh, prays the rosary, but quickly, you know, and with familiarity. But she wasn't praying, and it wasn't the rosary. What was she doing? She was chanting. What was she chanting? I don't know. It was in Latin. Does your sister speak Latin? No, she doesn't. Kate, would you mind just walking us through everything that happened next? She poured lawnmower gas on me, <clears throat> and she lit a match, and then she held it over me like she was going to set me on fire. Where was your dad or Jill? They were asleep. And they couldn't hear you? No, they were downstairs, and I was gagged. What happened next? She said that she was not my sister, that my sister belonged to her now, that she would hurt my sister if I interfered. Your sister said this? No, she did. She spoke through my sister. Did she sound like your sister? No. She sounded like someone inside my sister, using her against her will. Why do you think that? Because... Behind my sister's face, I could see another face. And that's the face that grinned at me when she stuck the lit match between the towel and my upper lip. And it was that face that moved my sister's mouth and used my sister's lungs to whisper, Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday, dear Anne. And happy birthday to me. And she 
paused like she was making a wish. And then she blew out the match. And then she started seizing. The entire left side of Anne's body shot out this spasm from her head down to her heels. And it was like someone flipped an off switch on her because she just dropped like she was broken. And that's when she started throwing up blood. Your Aunt Jessie and your great Aunt Beth have both described what's happening to your family as a curse. Is that how you would describe it? Yes, that's exactly how I would describe it. Is there any way to lift the curse? Not that we know of, no, except <laughs> Anne's thought about killing herself. That didn't seem like much of an option. Well, as far as we know, it's our only one. Suicide? Death. It's the only thing we haven't tried. And it's the one thing she knows we'll never try. Why is that? Because we're sisters. Where's Daryl? Uh, he's on channel three. What? I'm on channel three. Oh, uh, channel one, my bad. Ah, okay. Daryl? Okay, sure. Sure, yep. Uh, let's go ahead and grab a level on Mrs. Hickson while we can. Uh, miss. Go. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's um, mix, Miss Hickson now. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my apologies. It's okay. Just please call me Anne. Thank you, Anne. I'm just going to test this little guy real quick. Thank you. Uh, hey, Rick, can we grab a level on her? Yep, sure. Okay, uh, Jim needs... Okay, <laughs> thank you, Daryl. Okay, uh, Mrs. Hickson, so let's get oh, a level. Please just call oh. me Anne. Anne, yes, of course. I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, Jim. Okay, Anne, if you don't mind, would you say check a few times for me? Check. 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 Chatterbox Audio Theater presents Lineage by Kyle Hatley. Check. Check. Thank you, Anne. We got it. Okay, great. Uh, Kelly, how are we doing? Go ahead and Slater. I got a ways to go. Okay. Jim, are you good with that? Yes, sir, I am. Okay. Uh, Anne, is there anything we can get you? No, thank you. I'm good. Okay. Well, let's get started. The following interviews were conducted in 2015. What you're about to hear is a compilation of selected materials taken directly from those interviews and other source materials released to us by the family. Would you mind uh, just saying and spelling your full name for us, please? Anne Louise Hickson, A-N-N-E-L-O-U-I-S-E-H-I-X-O-N. Great, thank you. I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Oh, I'm Rick. Rick, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm usually really good with names. That's all right, no worries. Uh, so I'm Rick, that is Jim. Hey. He's our sound guy. Hey, Jim. That's Kelly on the camera. Hi. Hi, Kelly. And uh, Daryl is in the back. He's our producer. So that's our team. And hey, uh, Jim, I'm getting like a hum in my monitor. Yeah, that's that? traffic. There's a door open uh, in the church somewhere. Okay. Daryl's already going to okay. go check on Coffee. it. So thank fine. you, Jim. Um, can we get you anything, Ann? No, I'm fine. Thank hey, you. Rick, can you give me a hand with the... Oh, yeah. Hang on. Is it too bright? No, not bright enough. Here. This will spread it a little more evenly. Most churches keep their lights dim. Ah, Jim, hey, uh, Jim, my battery is low, I think. Uh, they're in the rec room. Blue duffel! Okay. How much longer, Kill? Uh, two minutes, tops. Okay, great. I'll be right back. What's all that? Uh, more stuff to spread the light around. It's a little darker than we anticipated, but that's why we have all this. Helps us put it where we need it. I'm sorry. For what? It just might have been easier to invite you to my home. But given the circumstances, I just felt safer here. I'm scared. About what? Sharing this. All this. We understand, Mrs. Hickson. It's miss. Not easy. Oh, of course, I'm sorry, miss. Just call me Anne. Anne, this isn't easy, what you're doing. Okay, how are we doing? All right, good, just need to snap this in. Okay. <sighs> Uh, yeah, he shut a few windows. He, f he found out. He's getting to the door now. Okay. Copy that, Daryl? Uh, yep, there it is. Much better. You good? Yep, thank you. Uh, Daryl's back on comm. Great, copy. Can we grab the room really quick? <laughs> oh, sure. Okay, uh, so, and we're just going to let the room sit in silence for a few seconds. Okay, we just need to grab some of the room tone. Okay. Okay. Okay, and hold still, please. Okay, we got it. Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to get started if that's okay. So, 
What are those, Anna, uh, in your hand there? These, um, this one is a letter from my aunt, and um, this one is a letter from my, my great aunt. Can you tell me about the, the uh, contents of those two letters? Yeah, they're, um, they're warnings, I guess. Warnings? Mm-hmm. For what? There's something inside of me. For her. Her? There's something in my family that... I don't really know how to say this, so... Holy Mother Mary, full of grace. There's, um... Something haunts our family. Something... Not good. Can you tell me what it is that haunts you and your family, Anne? Yes. A witch. A witch? Yes. The day I was born was also the day my mother died, and the day my Aunt Jessie and my Great Aunt Beth wrote the first of many, many letters to me and my sister, Kate. And uh, what were the, the uh, contents of those letters? Stories about the things that had happened to my mom and my grandmother. Stories about our family history, I guess. Beth and Jessie wanted us to be informed, so we might have a chance. A chance to what? Save my life. Hopefully my soul. From what? From her. So you weren't aware of your of your mother's death yeah. until... Until I was 15, I had no idea my mother died in childbirth. And that her mother died the same way. And her mother. And her mother. And her mother. All of them. And how old was your mother, Rachel, short when she passed? She was 30 years old. Okay. And your grandmother, Dorothy Dunn, when she passed? She was also 30. Okay. And your great-grandmother, Sarah? They were all 30 years old when they died. Kate, in your great-aunt Beth's research, like how far back have they traced this, this whole phenomenon? We think, we think as far back as the early 19th century, when our family came to America, starting with Emily McCann, who disappeared for five days and came back possessed by a witch, according to legend. About how old was Emily when she disappeared? She was 15. And how old was Anne turning in the surprise birthday video you showed us, the night she tied you up and, and threatened to burn you alive? 15. And how old was Emily when she died? She was 30. Kate, would you mind just sort of walking me down your your family line so we can get a clear understanding of the scope sure. and the lineage? Yeah, okay. uh, here it is. Um, this is our cheat sheet. Um, this is everyone. Everyone, she's... This list follows her port to port, so to speak, generation to generation through each younger sister over the years. Starting with Emily. Starting with Emily. Emily, yes. I'll read the dates out, too. Um See, Emily McCann was born in 1806. She disappeared in 1821. She dies in 1836, giving birth to her second daughter, Martha Hollis. Now, she dies in 1866, giving birth to her second daughter, Angela West. Then she dies in 1896, giving birth to Sarah Ross. Sarah Ross, my great-grandmother, dies in 1926, giving birth to Dorothy Dunn. Dorothy Dunn, my grandmother, dies giving birth to Rachel Short. Rachel, my mom, she died in 1986, giving birth to my little sister, Anne. And we were too young to remember her, obviously. Well, we never knew any of them. Just Aunt Jessie and Beth. And they all died in childbirth? And all while giving birth to their second daughter. Yes. That's a... That's just a staggering coincidence. Well, what's even more staggering is that it's not a coincidence. None of it is. Okay. It wasn't until Beth came along that anyone ever even noticed a pattern. And when she did notice one, it was the first thing she cautioned her sister against. What was? Sex! No sex, no pregnancy, no lineage, no curse, but she has a way of getting exactly what she wants. How so? She gets good at 
working you from the inside. Sometimes she's so good, you, you can't tell the difference between her and my sister. Sometimes you can feel the air change, and then you just know, but other times it's faint. And you don't want to get caught doubting your sister, because you start to lose trust, and in our situation, trust is all we had. But I wasn't always with her every second, I mean... You know, you grow up, you go your own way, and over the years, she... My sister did things. Things she didn't want to do. Things I know my sister would never do. Like what? Like... Falling in love with Daniel. Her husband? There's something wrong with... What? what if you weren't in charge of that part of your life? Of falling in love? What if someone else was, or something else, was in charge of it? She can do that? She can do anything. So, Anne, you have... Uh, so this this is the first letter you received from your great aunt mm -hmm. Beth about, about her, correct? Yeah, this right. is um, just a little part of what she... But she wrote, You and Kate are both in this together, and you will both need each other because you will both endure terrible things, the worst of which, I'm afraid, my dear Anne, will happen to you. You must forgive my plain speak, but it is imperative you know the truth so that you and Kate can get to work because we don't know how to stop her yet. And as of this bittersweet morning, my sweet Anne, we now have strong reason to believe that she is fixed on our bloodline. So I'm going to share my story with you, which is your grandmother's story. Your Aunt Jessie will share her story, which was your mother's story, and soon it'll be yours. And hopefully, Anne, by the time Kate's writing your little girl a letter, we'll be one step closer to changing the ending. When did she write that? The morning my mom died. The morning you were born? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she wrote how many letters? Beth? Hundreds. Yeah, there, are, there are hundreds of letters here. And your Aunt Jessie? Hundreds. They, they both. I, I started compiling all of them into a kind of journal, you know, um, organizing the research, the order of the information, and that kind of thing. When did you start doing that? On my birthday, which was a few months ago, almost a little more than three months ago. I've only just started, I guess. How old are you, Anne? I'm 29. Okay, would you say and spell your name, please? Jesse Short. J-E-S-S-I-E-S-H-O-R-T. -S -S okay, and you are Anne and Kate's aunt. That is correct. Sister of their mother, Rachel Short. That is correct. And daughter of Dorothy Dunn. That is correct. Okay. So can you tell me what you're about to play for us? Yes, yes. This is a cassette tape of an incident that occurred in October of 1971 between myself and my sister, Rachel. I had been taping things or, or trying to capture things that were happening because Rachel was having these spells, these sort of, um, uh, I don't know, these spells. Um, she would just sort of lose herself and go away someplace in her mind, I, I guess, and she would, not all the time, but sometimes she would say things to herself out loud, mumblings, and she didn't believe me. I mean, she knew she was passing out, but she didn't believe that she was saying these things while she was unconscious. So you started recording. So I started recording, yes, yes, yeah. with my father's machine. He had one of those big devices in his office, and I would sneak it upstairs and hide it. And, and then if anything odd happened with, with Rach, then I would, um, you know, I'd start the machine and just kind of let it roll. And in this particular recording, that was the first time I saw the thing inside her get hostile. Hostile? She came after me and threatened me. Would you mind playing that clip for us? The date is October 23rd. It's 2.15 in the morning. I woke up and my little sister was standing over me staring at me 
she was mouthing something, saying something like, like a prayer or something over and over and over. And she just kept saying it, mumbling it, and her eyes were open and she wasn't blinking. And I, I asked her if she was okay, and she said, she said, I'm going to be lonely in hell. I told her she was scaring me and to stop it. She just stared at me, so I told her to get in bed with me, but she wouldn't move. So I grabbed her hand, and as soon as I did, she started screaming. And then she started hitting me hard with her fists. I mean, she was making me bleed with her fists and her arms. So I grabbed a machine and ran into the bathroom, and she chased after me, banged on the door to get in, and, and now she just stopped. It's been quiet for a little while. The door's locked, but... Ah! Oh, She attacked me. She grabbed me by my throat and she meant to kill me. What did you do? Fought back. Fought for my life. I mean, she made me hurt my sister to save myself. How did you hurt your sister? I kicked her. I hit her. I managed to get her off of me, but she came at me again, so I hit her again. And she was still coming at me after a few moments. She had a, a seizure, and then she started throwing up blood, and that's when uh, Beth started talking to me about her experiences with our mother. How old were you? I was 17. Rachel was 15. Jesse, in that tape, your sister says, uh, like, a Latin phrase. Can you translate what she's saying? Yes. Um, first, I say, you're not my sister. And she, her, not my sister, responds in Latin. That is true. I am not your sister. And then she goes on to say, there is a river of my blood in her that I must swim. From port to port, I must swim and swim and swim. Port to port? Mother to daughter, as in from one generation to the next. And your story with your younger sister Rachel sounds similar to Kate's story about Anne. That's because they are similar. My mother and my Aunt Beth, my nieces, port to port, we've all experienced her. And when she arrives, she makes herself clear right off the bat. By scaring you? No, by holding your sister hostage. By using her against you to the, to the point that you have to protect yourself from how she uses your own sister against you. And unfortunately, that has yielded some upsetting results. This, um, this is the letter that I told you about over the phone. The cigarette story. The story in the letter was about Beth's experience with her younger sister Dorothy. It was one of the longer letters written to Anne. To read it would take longer than the event Beth is describing, and that was the point. Beth Dunn was a practiced writer and did what she could to make sure she was as clear as possible in communicating exactly what had happened to her. Of all the stories they've collected, this is the one they talk about the most. I think 
because she describes it so perfectly. Uh, like the the way in the air in the room changed, the way your skin felt, the way her the way her breath smelt even. God, the sense memory of it just Okay, the story that keeps coming up is this the one in this letter, the, the cigarette story. The cigarette story, story yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh it um Beth's letters, especially that one, made us feel uh, less alone, I guess. Less crazy, if that's possible. It tells the story of a 17-year-old Beth Dunn and her 15-year-old sister Dorothy. They were alone at home while their father was out of town on business. Beth was upstairs reading a magazine as it started to rain, and she felt like a smoke. She called to her sister downstairs and asked her to bring her one of her father's cigarettes. Dorothy chided Beth, but eventually relented and brought her the cigarette. Meanwhile, the storm outside worsened, and the lights in the whole neighborhood went out. Beth ran out to get a flashlight, and when she returned, she saw her younger sister, Dorothy, smoking as though she'd been doing so her whole life. How Beth describes her confrontation with her sister, or with her, is both detailed and chilling. Here are some excerpts of the letter being read by Jesse, Kate, and Anne. My heart became stone, and its weight pulled my chest down into my stomach, and I froze in horror. Dorothy, I said. She didn't respond. I retreated several steps and felt the air grow cold and dry. My skin pimpled with goose flesh, and I could feel it tighten around my body. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and then, in total darkness, I could hear her moving toward me, and I could hear her whispering, Obstabat nihil protestis vacare, Latin, which translates to, there is nothing you can do for her. I could see the lit end of my cigarette growing closer, and she whispered, mehu tua sora est, which translates to, your sister belongs to me. Her voice was not my sister's voice. It sounded like a throat that had been cut open in many places, leaving strips and flaps as if it were ripped to pieces, and when it spoke, it spoke through all the many shredded openings. The air was suddenly thick with the smell of something burning, the smell of something rotting, and there was a sudden humidity that accompanied that stench, and the pressure in the room changed. My sinuses began crackling, my ears ached and popped. Her grip on my throat tightened. Lightning struck again, sending lashes of bright white light whipping across the dark of our room, the flash revealing her face. I screamed. And I screamed. And I screamed. I've never seen anything like this, Anne. Not in life. Not in books or movies. Not anywhere. It is female, and it is not from our time. And when the lightning whipped across the room again, it did so in a three count, giving me a second and longer look. She was wearing my sister's face like a mask that didn't fit. A mask too small for the wearer. The cigarette rose once more, and its user enjoyed another long, hard drag. Her grip loosened around my neck. I wasn't going anywhere. I knew it, and she knew it. When her exhalation reached my face, it was a warm gust of stale smoke. But it came with the hot burn of cold rot from her long, dead breath. It made me vomit. Then it made me feel like my life was over and that I was dying. Please don't hurt me, I pleaded with her. I could hear her breathing. I wiped the vomit from my mouth and noticed my hands were vibrating with abject fear. I was in shock. Her grip tightened around my throat again, and my breathing slid slowly into short, gasping gulps that sputtered and hocked into cries. The kind of cry you cry when you're five, not seventeen. I was petrified. But in there somewhere, in all that fear enveloping me, there was this little voice deep inside me, and it was determined. It was determined to not be so little. This little voice was composing something enormous, a question, an urgent question, but I couldn't quite make it out. But that little voice got very loud, very suddenly and very unexpectedly, and its sudden growth consumed me. I thought I was paralyzed with fear, brain dead from it. 
But to my astonishment, my mouth opened and out came the little voice's words, not with a small whisper I would have expected, but with a giant roar. What have you done with my sister? What have you done with my sister? What have you done with my sister? Lightning struck and I saw her a third time. Blood came spilling out of her nose and eyes. The skin was stretched so intensely. She snarled and put her face close to mine. I could smell her rot. My free arm worked against hers, but it was no match. Her grip was killing me and my vision began to blur. Death felt imminent. She brought the cigarette once more to her dead lips and sucked on it. Just as I was about to black out, two things happened simultaneously. The first thing was she released her grip on my throat, and the second thing was she blew all of her smoke into my mouth as I reflexively gasped for air. The smoke and the heat of her foul breath sucked down into my bowels, and I vomited again. Et oui debis tu a mariar, she said. Which translates to... You will watch your sister die. The lit end of the cigarette, which was propped loosely in her fingers, hovered in front of me, giving away her position in the room's darkness. The lightning flashed, and I could see her smile, the most horribly wide and wicked smile I have ever seen. Omnis morimor et observare, she said. You will watch them all die. And then she said, Et videbitis me et iterum renascuratur. Which translates to, and you will see me born again, at iterum, and again, at iterum, and again, at iterum, and again. And then I took action. I took the cigarette, corrected its position, and quickly put the lit end of it directly into her left eye. She clapped her hands to her face and screamed out a howl of pain. I stood suddenly. I didn't have a plan. That little voice was back, and it was stronger than ever. It was stronger than ever. I kicked her. I kicked her hard. I kicked her in the face and in the head. Where's my sister? I screamed. And I kicked her again. I was fighting for my life. I was fighting for my life. Where is she? I kicked her again. Lightning flash. I kicked her again, even harder. Lightning flash. I kicked her again, too hard this time. Lightning flash. I screamed and kicked and kicked and kicked and kicked until... Until the lights came back on. I stumbled at the sensation of so much light so suddenly and fell against the base of Dorothy's bed. My eyes were stinging and my foot was throbbing. And when my eyes adjusted, the room was a wreck, and in the middle of it was my sister Dorothy. She was crying. Dorothy, I tried. And then the tiniest little sound came from her. Beth? It was her. It was Dorothy, my little sister. And I ran to her, and I scooped her up, and I held her. She was shaking. And crying. She was trembling. Her whole body was trembling. And sobbing out those terrible sounds. Sound so awful, they must have come from her soul. I broke her jaw in two places. It was locked to the left, like a typewriter cocked for the first word on a fresh page. It was a grisly image, her jaw, and the blood that fell out of it from within. But that wasn't all. Pretty far from it, unfortunately. I also fractured her left cheekbone, which splintered and punctured her left eardrum, causing it to rupture, rendering her deaf in one ear. The bottom third of her left ear was separated from the top of her neck and hung like a strange flap, cowlicked at an awkward angle and bleeding in thick purple-red drips onto her light blue sweater. Every kick connected with her face and mouth, knocking out four teeth and cracking another, which later had to be pulled. Her nose was broken four times. Four times. But the worst part the is... The worst part is... She knew what happened. She may not have been in control, but it still lived in her like a memory. She didn't see what I saw, but she felt what she did to me. We held each other. And we cried in fear for our lives. And then we went to the emergency room with a lie about a home invasion, and that's when it all started for us. That's when it all started for us. Your grandmother and me, your mom and Aunt Jessie. And now for you. I'll write another letter tomorrow, and there's much to take in. Until the very end and the always forever Until the after very that. end and the always forever after that. Until the very end that. and the always forever after that. Beth. It's one thing to protect yourself from harm, from, from evil. But if the cost is doing that to your sister, you know, that, that saying there, until the very end and the always forever after that, Beth used to say that. It means that no matter what, we will be there with you, with our sister, with each other, forever in life, 
in death. We will be together. I will suffer what you suffer. The first thing that you shared with us, your first contact with her, the, the cassette recording <clears throat> of you and Rachel. Mm -hmm. In Beth's story, when she spoke, she spoke Latin. But in the tape, in, in your story, she was also speaking in English. In English, yes, yes. Beth wrote about this, too. She's adapting with the bloodline. She learns. She's there when Dorothy went to school. She's there when Rachel falls in love. She's there when Anne is born, when Rachel dies. She's there. She's always there. Do you know any Latin? We were raised Catholic. In our day, we attended morning mass, which, yes, was in Latin, so I'm pretty familiar with it, more so in 71 than today. And as, uh, how would you describe her activity? Is there like a pattern? Or? Every 15 years. That's the pattern we've identified. Beth wrote about this. In, um, okay, here. Um, Beth wrote uh, this in a different... There is a moment of birth where there is also a moment of death at an interval of every 30 years. She leaves one host body for another. It's as though there is some kind of transference. Once complete, she is dormant for 15 years. Did you say that uh, Beth was a big influence on you growing up? Oh, absolutely. She was the only mother figure in my life. And when did she pass? Not too long ago. Sadly, cancer, ovarian. And Jesse, during all this, was your father ever involved? No, no, my father wasn't involved. No, not, not directly. Anyway, what do you mean not directly? Well, you have to keep in mind this was 1971 when Rachel and I were going through this, and Dad was, Dad, he wasn't able to. I mean, he would have thought his daughters were on drugs or something. You know, and our dad had a hard time being a dad. He didn't have sisters growing up because he was an only child, and his dad was just awful and hardly ever around. So here he was, a single father raising two teenage girls. <laughs> he didn't stand a chance, really. <laughs> and Andy was gone a lot. He was a police officer, worked the graveyard shift. And when he came home, he was, you know, he, he was exhausted. We took care of him. And, you know, Dorothy and Beth's dad, my granddad, was, well, he was depressed, and to be honest, a little delusional. <laughs> well, in fairness, isn't that what, what all of you are afraid of? What? Being delusional. Yeah. Oh, oh by all means, yes. <laughs> we thought we were insane. Do you think you're insane? Now? Yeah. No, I don't. I wish I were. Uh, hey, can I get a glass of water or something? Sure, absolutely. Jim, do you mind? Uh, you bet. Okay. Uh, so this here, this yeah, is... Yeah, this is a, a video of um, my sister Anne when we were... When Anne was 15 and I was 17. Okay. When did this... When did all this happen? Uh, in This happened in uh, October... Uh, that was on October 23rd, 2001, about three weeks after her surprise birthday party. So this is my, this was my second encounter, I guess, with her. And we were alone. Dad and Jill were out. It was her birthday. It was her birthday now. That's right. So we were home by ourselves, which was, we'd done it a million times, so no big deal. We were bored and thought we'd bake Jill a birthday cake. It was Anne's idea, actually. And this time we would surprise them. Right? Or Jill, anyway. <laughs> oh, thank you. We like Jill. A lot. <sighs> we liked having a woman in our lives. My dad was great, but he was dad, you know, and we craved Jill's attention. But so... Uh, while we were uh, scrounging around for all the stuff in the kitchen. I thought it would also be fun to make a video of us making the cake, like a cooking show. It's dumb, but it seemed like it would be fun. It was a neat way to pass the time. And we were good kids. No drugs, no alcohol, good grades. We didn't need much. We enjoyed each other's company. And we did everything together, Anne and me. But 
while we were um, while we were filming and <clears throat> changed some of it's on camera, but most of it, <coughs> sorry, uh, most of it happens off camera. We just kind of had it propped, you know, on that stupid tripod. So it wasn't like it was meant to capture any of what it ended up capturing, but y you could still hear it. <laughs> Good evening, America. I'm Kate Bryant. And I'm Anne Bryant. And we are the, the Bryant Sister Sisters. Sisters. That's right. That's what we that's said. The Bryant Baker Sisters. Bryant Baker Sisters. <laughs> Whoever we are. Yes, that's right. Tonight we'll be making a pineapple upside down cake. Mm -hmm. Tell them why, Anne. Oh, well, that's right, Kate. It's because we're making this cake for a wonderful woman on this very special day. That's right, everyone. It's Jill Garrett's birthday. Yay! <laughs> In fact, Kate, you know what time it is? <laughs> no, Anne, what time is it? It's time to sing happy birthday. No, no, not yet. We have to bake the cake first. She's going to have to watch the video well, before you, we have a birthday. Don't sing happy birthday without a cake. In front At the request of the family, some of the footage here has been edited to omit some of the more graphic moments. All right, and two eggs. Two eggs. <laughs> Indeed. Now, if you'll add those, I'll get the um, dry ingredients mixed up. Roger that, Kate. Now, you want to be sure and mix the flour and salt and baking soda thoroughly. Now, this mixer is a little... Anne, would you mind handing me the good mixer? Anne? I don't feel good. What? I don't feel good. What's wrong? Well, what, is it your stomach? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, and my chest and my back, and it's everywhere. I'm calm down. <laughs> oh, 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 Kate, make it stop. It hurts, Kate. Oh, it hurts, a lot of pain. Are you hearing me? Oh, please. please. Dad and Jill died in a car wreck on the way home. We lived with Aunt Jessie after that. Those poor girls. They lost their mama. We all lost our mothers, I guess. And so there's this side of our lives that feels unanswered or stolen. That's a better word for it, stolen. We don't know our mothers. But these two girls, Kate and Anne, they didn't deserve to lose their daddy, too. And Jill, this sweet woman that the girls were just in love with, stolen from them as well. She was a good woman, Jill. And she loved them like they were her own. I don't know. Maybe Jill was getting too close to the family. Or maybe the world interfered like it did for me when my... When my husband left me, or when Beth's husband left her, and poor Kate, she never really, Kate hasn't been particularly close with anyone except Anne, 
she keeps a distance from the rest of the world. Why do you think that is? And would you mind uh, telling me a little bit about your sister, Kate? Sure. My sister's always been there for me, uh, just like Beth and Jesse said she would be. Kate lives with me now. What about your husband? Uh, Daniel. Yeah, Daniel, where's your husband in all this? We're... We're separated. Kate, what happened with Anne's husband? He um, asked for a divorce almost a year now. Just up and left her? I mean, yeah, just... he left her. But she kept his name. Yeah, for their little girl's sake. Grace. Keeps him in her life. Mm. How old is Grace now? Almost 14 months. Oh, and did you come up with her name or did... Uh... I did, yeah. When we, uh, when I found out, when I found out I was having a little girl, I just had this image, I guess, a sweet little dancer, a sweet little prayer. Her name is Perfect. And Daniel, I mean, hmm? why did he, why did he leave you and Grace behind? <sighs> Well, he, he couldn't believe all of this. I don't blame him. I still don't. I still have a hard time with it. But, um, how can anybody be expected to live like that? You know, when, like this, how can he be expected to give up his life? It's not fair. For him, I mean, it's not fair. He has his whole life ahead of him. What about you? Me? And you're only 29. You have your whole life ahead of you, too. No. I don't. Why is that? Because I'm pregnant again. This story is dedicated to the memory of Anne Louise Hickson, who died on October 24th, 2016, giving birth to her second daughter, Emily Hickson. She was buried in a plot purchased by her great-aunt Beth. The plot now holds all the bodies of their ancestors. Some have been transported from their original plots. Anne's daughters Grace and Emily live with Kate. Kate wrote her first letter to little Emily on the day she was born, which is also the day her sister Anne died. The epitaph on Anne's tombstone reads, Beloved daughter, sister, and mother. And just below that it reads, Until the very end, and the always forever after that. You have been listening to Chatterbox Audio Theater's production of Lineage by Kyle Hatley, featuring Emily Draffin as Anne, Kim Justice as Kate, Cecilia Wingate as Jesse, Robert Arnold as Rick, Ray Bowler as Kelly, and Brent Davis as Jim. Latin advisor, Brooks Eichner. Artwork by Emily Shackelford. Produced and directed by Robert Arnold. The mission of Chatterbox Audio Theater is sparking imaginations through outstanding theatrical recordings. Download our shows, meet our cast and crew, and make a donation to support our work at www.chatterboxtheater.org. You're tuned into Monday Matinee on the Mutual Audio Network. Tomorrow is all things horror on Tuesday Terrors. Subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed for every day or find Tuesday Terrors in your favorite podcast players.